Now, this week's episode is called The True Measure of a Man. And I was given this book after a speaking engagement last week by a man I, I respect a great deal, and he, he thought it would be great if I read it. And as I started to read it on this Tuesday morning after a holiday weekend, I was like, you know what? This shouldn't just be for John Eads, whatever is going to come next. It should be for our podcast listeners or watchers as well. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to read a very important story from The True Measure of a Man by Richard E. Simmons. And as I go through this story, I just want you to reflect on what it means for you in your journey right now as a leader. And it's called The Wreck of the Persona. Once a very prosperous man decided to build for himself a sailing yacht. His intention was that it would be the most talked about boat that ever sailed. He was determined to spare no expense or effort. As he built his craft, the man outfitted it with colorful sails, complex rigging, and comfortable conveniences in the cabin. The decks were made from teak wood. All the fittings were custom made of polished brass, and on the stern, painted in gold letters, Readable from a considerable distance was the name of the boat, the Persona. As he built the Persona, the man could not resist fantasizing upon the anticipated admiration and applause from club members at the launching of his new boat. In fact, the more he thought about the praise that was soon to come, the more time and attention he gave the boat's appearance. Now... And this seemed reasonable because no one would ever see the underside of the persona. The man saw little need to be concerned about the keel or, for that matter, anything that had to do with the issues of properly distributed weight and ballast. The boat builder was acting with the perceptions of the crowd in his mind, not the seaworthiness of the vessel. Seaworthiness seemed not to be an important issue while one is in dry dock. Why would I spend money or time on what is out of sight? When I listen to the conversations of people at the club, I hear them praising only what they can see, he told himself. I never remember anyone admiring the underside of a boat. Instead, I sense that my yachting colleagues really find exciting the color and shape of the boat's sails, its brass fittings, its cabin and creature comforts, decks and wood texture, potential speed, and the skill that wins the Sunday afternoon regattas. And so, driven by such reasoning, the man built his boat and everything that would be visible to the people soon began to gleam with excellence. But things that would be invisible when the boat entered the water were generally ignored. People did not seem to take notice of this, or, or if they did, they made no comment. The builders sorting out priorities of resources and time proved to be correct. Members of the boat club did indeed understand and appreciate the sails, rigging, decks, brass, and staterooms. And what they saw, they praised. On occasion, he overheard some of them say that his efforts to build the grandest boat in the history of the club would certainly result in his selection as Commodore. When the day came for the maiden voyage, the people of the club joined him dockside, a champagne bottle was broken over the bow, and the moment came for the man to set sail. As the breeze filled the sails and pushed the persona from the club's harbor, he stood at the helm and heard what he'd anticipated for years, the cheers and the well wishes of envious admirers who said to one another, our club has never seen a grander boat than this. This man will make us the talk of the yachting world. Soon, the persona was merely a blip on the horizon. And as it cut through 
the swells, its builder and owner grip the rudder with the feeling of fierce pride. What he had accomplished. He was seized with the increasing rush of confidence that everything, the boat, his feature as the boat club member and probably as Commodore and even the ocean was his to control. But a few miles out to sea, the storm arose. Not a hurricane, but not a squall either. There were sudden gusts in excess of 40 knots and waves above 15 feet, and the persona began to shudder. The water swept over its sides. Bad things began to happen, and the poise of the captain began to waver. Perhaps the ocean wasn't his after all. Within minutes, the persona's colorful sails were in shreds. The splendid mast was splintered into pieces, and the rigging was unceremoniously draped all over the bow. The teakwood decks and lavishly appointed cabin were awash with water, and then, before the man could prepare himself, a wave bigger than anything he'd ever seen hurled down upon the persona and the boat capsized. Now, this is important. Most boats wouldn't have righted themselves after such a battering. The persona did not. Why? Because its builder had ignored the importance of what was below the waterline. There was no weight there. In a moment when a well-designed keel and adequate ballast might have saved the ship, they were nowhere to be found. The man had concerned himself with the appearance of things and not enough with the needed resilience and stability in the secret, unseen places where storms are withstood. Furthermore, because the foolish man had such confidence in his sailing abilities, he had never contemplated the possibility of a situation he could not manage. And that's why later investigations revealed that there were no rescue devices aboard, no rafts, life jackets, or emergency radios. And the result of this mixture of poor planning and blind pride was that the foolish man was lost at sea. Only when the wreckage of the persona was washed ashore did the man's boat club friends discover all of this. They said only a fool would design and build a boat like this, much less sail in it. A man who builds only above the water does not realize that he has built less than half a boat. Didn't he understand that a boat not built with storms in mind is a floating disaster waiting to happen? How absurd that we should have to ap applaud at him so enthusiastically. The foolish man was never found. Today, when people speak of him, which is rare, they comment not upon the initial success of a man or upon the beauty of his boat, but only upon the silliness of putting out on an ocean where storms are sudden and violent and doing it with a boat that was really never built for anything else but the vanity of its builder and the praise of spectators. It was in such conversations that the owner of the persona whose name has long been forgotten, became known as simply the foolish man. The true measure of a man. Building a boat called the persona that was only focused on what was above the water and not what was below it is what so many of us do. 
We, we like to consider what other people are thinking, what, how other people perceive us. We like to give an appearance that we're great at X or great at Y. But the reality is many of us ignore what really matters in leadership, which is the foundation upon which you build your leadership. What's inside, not what's outside. We don't consider really building a foundation of character because we want it now. We want the success, the admiration, the praise, the money. We want everything now and we sacrifice what it's really required to build something that it's going to sustain in storms. We don't really consider how strong our foundation actually needs to be. Things like our character, the mental and moral qualities distinctive to you and me as an individual, doing what's right when no one is looking. That we get to look right in that mirror every single day and say, I'm building for the long haul, not for the short term. I'm building to be a man of great character that can make those hard decisions when we're tempted the most. Because it's not if those situations happen. It's when those situations happen. I think a, a, a mentor of mine said to me one time that, uh, you know, many men or women will talk about, well, I've never cheated on my wife or my spouse. And he said, the reality is most men and women really haven't been tempted to cheat on their husband or wife. They haven't put themselves in those kind of situations. They haven't accomplished things where these temptations really are going to stretch their character. I'm not recommending you be put in those situations or be tempted, but I am suggesting that your character be built to withstand temptations like that. But it's not just your character. That is the true measure of a man or a woman. It's also your values. Those fundamental beliefs you hold to be true that under no circumstance that you're going to deviate from them. Yes, you're human. You're going to have those one word values that at the end of that day you said, did I live that out to the very best of my abilities? Maybe not. But you have to know what the values are. You've got to have them in phrases that you can remember and lean on in really challenging and or good situations. So first we have our character that we've got to mold and develop and we've got to help allow others into our life to speak into us, to know when we're living out that character. Second, we've got to define our core values. We've got to know what they are. We've got to put them in phrases. We've got to live by them every single day. And then we get to this little six inches between your ears. And that is your mindset every single day. Not just a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset, but I'm talking about somebody that takes their mindset so seriously. They protect it at all costs because they know that the real power is between their ears. They know that it's, They've seen so many victim mindsets in their life. People that want to blame everybody else. No, that's not them. They're not going to be a victim. But then that's level one. Level two is that negative mindset that, that is just looking for the wrong in everything. That's looking for what's bad or what could go wrong. That negative or pessimistic mindset. But no, that's not them either. 
because they're positive and that's, they're optimistic. But see, that's level three mindset, just positive or optimistic. And you would think, oh, isn't that the best? No, it's not the best. It's important that you're positive. It's important that you're optimistic. But if we don't blend that with what's really going on, the truth of the situation, we go in blind. That's level four, a realist mindset. Someone that knows the words of Napoleon, that, that a leader's job is to define reality and to deliver hope. They have to start with the truth, to be real about where they really are before they move forward with optimistic or hopeful thinking. We have to know where we stand because all improvement starts with the truth. Level four is realistic. And level five is that, that champion mindset. That there, it's like you're working, looking, seeking, looking for a worthy competitor. You are so dedicated to your mindset and getting to the very optimum level that you're constantly doing hard things. I think very few people actually get to this mindset. So the true measure of a man, the foundation, not just looking above what everybody else see, but looking into the hole, the bottom of the boat that nobody sees, the foundation upon which you build your house. Without it, it is worthless. What is your character? What are your core values? And what is your mindset that you work so hard to cultivate every single day? Those are the three things I want you to focus on today. And as you think about that boat, the persona, and that man that spent so much time, energy, effort, and money to build something that other people would admire him for and sing his praises for, I want you to consider not all the good bells and whistles in your life or that something that somebody might be impressed with. I want you to focus on the true measure of a man or a woman and what's at the bottom of it. What's at the base of you? What is your character? What are your values? And what does your mindset look like? Until next time, be a great leader at work and at home.